Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5 on Heredity. This is video number 11, and we're going to be looking at DNA replication. But this is the third of the modelling process uh, outcomes that we're focusing on and um, that relate to cell replication. And in this one specifically, there's actually a lot to do. We want to look at DNA replication using the Watson-Crick model of DNA and including nucleotide composition, pairing and bonding. So this is basically a bit of a crash course on DNA structure and also the process of replication. You may be familiar with some of these processes from work that you've completed in the past. Um, if not, you probably do want to go and have a look at some things in a little bit more detail because we've got a modeling exercise happening in class. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I will give you some of the general um, details that you can then go in and fill in in a little bit more detail as you do more of your research. So let's get to it. The first thing that you need to be able to do because you can't do anything else is to be able to describe the Watson and Crick model of DNA. Once you can do that, um, then hopefully you'll understand the way that the bases pair together and therefore how that could help facilitate the DNA replication process, particularly something as precise and accurate as this one and then to talk more specifically about what's actually happening and maybe being able to mention some of the enzymes that are involved and so on. So here's the Watson and Crick model of DNA. And the first thing to notice is our nucleotides units and also the fact that we have uh, four separate bases that are part of each of these nucleotide units. So our nucleotide... consists of a sugar and a phosphate, and the sugar and the phosphate are part of the backbone of our uh, double helix. If um, this is a ladder or a twisted ladder, then the uprights of the ladder will be these phosphate and sugar alternating groups. The sugar is a ribose sugar. It's not a hexo sugar, so it's not like glucose one that we've looked at previously. It's a five carbon sugar. And the phosphate group has uh, a phosphorus and four oxygens attached to it. And it's part of the attachment site that gives this um, string of DNA its rigidity on the edges. In between, so if you like, the rungs of the ladder are each of these nitrogenous bases or nucleobases we've talked about here. So this is a base. And the base comes in one of four different varieties. And they are cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. Now, my references are getting a little bit old because I still work on George Clooney to help me remember that the Gs and the Cs go together. Some people look at the fact that the Gs and the Cs are both curved and the A and the T both have uh, straight edges to them. There's lots of different ways you might actually have the initials T, A, A, T, G, C, or C, G, or you might have someone in your class who does, and if they do, obviously they're an easy person to remember and associate with the way the bases pair, because that is the critical part of not only how the DNA locks together, but also how it pulls apart during the process of DNA replication and ensures that it's copied uh, precisely and effectively. This discovery of the base paired pattern, uh, not to mention the helical nature of DNA, which really wasn't apparent to Watson and Crick until they saw the X-ray crystallography pictures of Rosalind Franklin. And that's a, that's a great story. Um, it's probably not a great story for the role of women in science, although in one sense it's a great story about women in science because Rosalind Franklin's contribution was immense to uh, our understanding of the uh, structure of DNA. Unfortunately, though, um, there were some questions about how the uh, material actually made its, hand, made its way into Watson and Crick's hands in the first place. And, of course, you, I'm sure you'll be aware of the story that when the um, Nobel Prizes were awarded, unfortunately, Rosen Franklin had passed away, and they don't award them posthumously. So she missed out, and, that, and that's a bit of a travesty, I have to say. However, from her work, from the deductions and conclusions, and also the great modelling that Watson and Crick did, and I'm sure if you Google them, you'll see photos of them standing next to these life-size 
models of DNA, and certainly um, they went to a lot more trouble than I expect we will with our models. Uh, but that gave us the structure of DNA. So these nucleotide bases repeating one another, um, they are duplicated or actually the complementary on the opposite side here. So we call the two bases complementary. So I don't want you to think that they are exactly the same. So it's not an A with an A, it's an A with a T and a G with a C. So that's why we get these kind of, you see these colored bars often being used to describe different types of bases. And that's also a very good way um, to demonstrate this when you're building models. So here's a nucleotide in a little bit more um, close up, if you like. So here's my nucleotide. My nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group over here. My ribose sugar here, uh, which may or may not have an extra oxygen. And that's one of the things that distinguishes between deoxyribose or DNA. Um, and ribose nucleic acid, which is RNA. And we'll look at RNA a little bit more detail when we look at protein synthesis. Um, and here's the base. So this base is cytosine. So this is C. So we would expect it to link uh, to uh, G. And you can see coming down here, uh, for the chemists, the link between the bases uh, within the double helix are hydrogen bonds. That's not something we necessarily need to worry about as biologists but certainly something that hopefully will, will fit into um, the knowledge of, of those of you who also do chemistry. The biochemistry of this molecule isn't too critical. I don't read it in, in it that it is. If you understand the basic structure, which is alternating sugar and phosphate groups on the side, bases in the rungs of the ladder, and of course, every time we draw this, we draw it in a... Um, two-dimensional fashion, but we've got to think about it in a three-dimensional fashion as if it's actually a twisted staircase. That's important. So how do we use that model to explain DNA replication? Well, there's a couple of important things that are part of this. And I, and I, when, I when you're looking at these sorts of things, I guess there's a tendency to think, to what level do I want to focus on the enzymes involved? We started this course with enzymes right back in the cells as the basis of life. We looked at enzymes, very important proteins that have very specific um, links to their substrate and any changes in them means they don't function as effectively as they could. And enzymes are involved in all sorts of different chemical processes in cells. And DNA replication is no exception. In fact, there's a large number of different types of enzymes that are involved in different stages of the process. So if you think about it as a double helix, a coil double helix, we've got to unwind it. So one of the ways we unwind it is with this topoisomerase. So this ASE ending is always the clue to enzymes. If you see that ending, that's always telling you there's probably an enzyme here. And usually the reaction that it catalyzes, you can get to from the um, part that's in front of the ASE ending. So we need to kind of loosen the bonds and unwind the bonds so that it becomes kind of straighter. And so the toporosomerase is basically going to loosen those bonds. Uh, helicase is going to come in and basically uncoil the helix. We've got the strands that are going to start to um, pull apart. And so we need, we need, if you like, you often see DNA repl uh, replication represented like a zipper with with the bases at the top sort of starting to pull away from each other. Now, of course, at the same time that all this is happening, the nuclear membrane has broken down. And this is important because free nucleotides that are in the cytoplasm need to be able to actually get to the free end, that, that end of the DNA that's breaking, that's being broken open, if you like, or zipped apart, so that new nucleotides can come in. And what's really nice about this process of course, is if we have a G, C, T, A, and then on the other side, we have our T, A, C, G. As the nucleotides come in, what they're going to do is they're going to kick in with that complementary base. So we're going to end up with two nice copies, hopefully identical with no mutations and no problems. And you're going to end up with two perfect copies, one original, one new strand uh, for our DNA. DNA primase is also involved in this. It's another um, 
enzyme, as you can tell from the ASC ending, and same thing with DNA polymerase, which, uh, polymerase, which actually helps um, determine what nucleotides are going to replicate. So, um, so we need a coordinated response here. We need the right nucleotides with the right nitrogenous base coming in, linking in with the free bases that are kind of exposed as the zipper's been pulled down, as these enzymes have um, pulled this particular molecule apart. And so there's a lot of uh, steps to this, and that's part of what we want you to do in the modeling process, is to think about how you're going to model this, how you're going to represent this process in simple, if simple enough terms, because that's what our models do. And I guess the challenge with models is that they're not too simple, but that they're sufficient in order for us to explain what's going on. Once we've um, had a DNA polymerase, in, uh, polymerase involved in the process um, of building these new complementary bases, nucleotides that are all pulling together, we have to make sure that there's no mistakes. Mutations can happen. Um, the way that the bases pair is pretty good. It's pretty precise. In fact, it's the nature of this molecule that has um, enabled, that is the reason why so many organisms' um, genetic makeup is based on this um, fascinating uh, and complex and yet elegant molecule. So we've got a series of enzymes that are basically going to work their way down um, and continue to produce these new strands of DNA. So um, pictorially, it wants to look something like this. So you can see here, these are some of the enzymes that we've already talked about, our uh, topoisomerase, um, our helicase, our primase, and our little sections that are actually being added in to uh, replicate this DNA molecule so that as the um, as the enzyme sort of move down through this um, one um, double stranded DNA it's pulling them apart new strands are coming in new um, nucleotides are coming in adding to each of these free ends uh, linking into these little Okazaki fragments and Enzymes are involved in the process of pulling this molecule apart and sticking the new bits back together again. So you can see there's a lot of stuff happening in DNA replication, lots of opportunities for modeling and for you to be able to maybe delve a little bit deeper into some of these processes, exactly what's going on um, in different places, and also to have a look at maybe some of the potential um, challenges that occur when the process doesn't, isn't perfect, when replication doesn't happen perfectly. And obviously, um, there are some um, quite significant consequences that could happen as a result of that. This is just an intro. I think this is another one of these areas where there's a huge amount of information that we could put together and we've already been uh, going for long enough now. So let's, let's pull it there, have a look at some of these things in a little bit more detail in class and also give you somewhere to go with your modeling exercise. Thanks for watching.